You know, I'm never going to forget the first time I experienced step by step. In the New York City area, there is no step by step on pay phones and home phones. So it was quite a novelty when I first ran into it in Atlanta. And it just amazed me that when I would dial a local prefix that was maybe 20 miles out in the sticks or so, as soon as I dialed the third digit of the prefix, I could already hear the carrier noise of the connection out to that very, very uh, distant place before I had even dialed the complete phone number. In fact, the following call is very much like what I heard in Atlanta uh, because the types of offices involved are identical. This is a call from a number one step with City Ring out to a Bell System CDO, Community Dial Office. That's a term used for a very small central office in a rural area with the oldest type of CDO ring, and uh, the trunks from here to there are M3 carrier, which is a Bell System 2600 controlled uh, carrier system, analog of course, and you'll hear the M3 carrier come on just as soon as we dial the third digit here. Now, the busy signal that goes with that ring tends to be talkable. Some telephone lines are so long that they really hum. And since you can hear the phone line during ring, you can actually tell before the person has even answered just how long their phone line is by the way it sounds. This next call happens to go to a line that has double ring, but listen to how hummy the phone line is because of its length. <laughs> This CDO does not identify to AIS, which is a good indicator that it probably does not have automatic number identification for long-distance calls. So when people pick up and dial a long-distance call, the operator comes on and says, your number, please. And then the operator keys in the number, they say, and then the call goes through automatically the rest of the way. Now, for an office like this, the AIS number you have reached. has to operate differently because... There's no way that it knows the number you're calling until an operator keys it in. 
Since it isn't fully automated, you can accidentally go to intercept and get the intercept operator, not knowing that you've misdialed, and they have a special recording for that case. This call to the AIS in Charlotte has three different 2600 links on it, uh, and you can hear it. The first 2600 link is from us out to that little uh, step office that we're calling, and that 2600 link is on hook through this entire call. As a result, there's a notch filter that is in place to keep the loud 2600 coming back in our direction from hurting our ears, but you can hear the 26 in the background. Now that's actually very loud, but there's a notch filter filtering it out. And as a result, when the AIS trunk unsoups, unsoups is a phone freak term for going on hook. When the AIS trunk goes on hook, there are two quick cheeps of those two links going on hook, but you don't hear the actual tone of it because through this connection it's being filtered by that same notch filter. So notice as the AIS hangs up, See, you don't really hear the cheeps at full volume. And again, that's because our first link out to the CDO itself is continuously unsouped through all of this. Why? Because this is an intercept call, and intercept calls don't soup. So the intercept trunk can soup and unsoup all it likes, and it doesn't ever get back to us. Now, I'd say maybe half of all the Bell System Step CDOs sound pretty much like the one we're just calling. This next call to the 266 office demonstrates the newer Bell System Step CDO ring. That's the newer CDO ring, not to be confused with the old CDO ring. Now, here's the new CDO busy. You might have heard me calling in from my other line and saying hello through that, but it was barely audible. And the newer ones tended not to be talkable. One neat feature of step CDOs is they often have vacant level recordings recorded right there in the little central office. Very often you'll hear step noise in the background as the guy turns on the magnetic drum recorder and starts talking into a little carbon mic. This type of magnetic drum recorder is known as a 7A in the bell system, and it has a long magnetic cylinder onto which the audio track is recorded. The cylinder turns continuously while the head 
moves horizontally, and that creates a spiral-shaped audio track of pretty much any length, up to about two minutes, I think. And when the guy finishes his recording, there's a device very much like the margin on a manual typewriter, which marks the spot where he finished, and as soon as the recorder, when it's playing back, hits that margin-like device, it uh, shuts off and snaps the head back to the beginning, and you can actually hear it doing that because it always makes a type sound at the end. spiral-shaped recording path does lend itself to a common problem. The local vacant level recording in the step from which we're dialing demonstrates very aptly what happens when a 7A recorder's rotating drum gets 180 degrees out of phase with the moving head, and the spiral-shaped recording path doesn't work exactly as intended. <laughs> Please check the number and dial again or call your operator to help you. This is a recording. Call your operator. 919 833. 919 833. Happy completed is dialed. Please check the number and dial again or call your operator to help you. This is a recording. Call your operator. 919 833. 919-833. All right, on to 411. TSPS is one of the earlier electronic switching systems developed by Bell Labs in the late 60s and um, very common by the late 70s. It stands for Traffic Service Position System. It serves the function of zero-plus dialing collect calls, third number billing, and things of that nature. It has a cordless switchboard, pretty large console. The TSPS is not a tandem in itself. It's just a system that brings operators in and makes tickets for calls. It is also used in many places for the CAMA, the Centralized Automated Message Accounting function. And so directory assistance charging, which began in the middle 70s, often involves putting the call through TSPS to let the call be ticketed there, and then the call is passed on to the directory assistance operator, which is not in TSPS. Now, there's a perfectly good TSPS right here in Raleigh, but they didn't use it for 411. They're sending 411 to a distant TSPS, apparently in Greensboro. And, to make matters even stranger, they're not using the automatic number identification feature that this step clearly has. Instead, they're deliberately sending the tones and they actually have a little relay device in there sending the tones to tell the TSPS in Greensboro that the number cannot be sent forward, even though it could easily be sent forward. This requires a Greensboro TSPS operator to come on the line and say, your number, please. Now notice right after I dial 411, you'll hear three tones. <laughs>
Isn't it amazing? Three operators to get directory systems. And uh, the first one really wasn't necessary. But uh, a lot of vestiges of the old ways of doing things in the Bell system, which was very operator-oriented originally, uh, still remained in 1979. Now, you might have only heard two MFs, and that's because only two MFs were required. Listen again. Here's what happened on that last call just when, uh, when I dialed 411. The instant the TSPS heard the key pulse followed by the 1, it immediately went into the queue for an operator. And at that moment, it ceased reflecting back the sound. For that reason, the third MF, though it was sent, is barely audible. Uh, but on this next call, it just so happens that something that could reflect that third tone's sound back to us came on the line immediately, in this case, a, uh, an operator answering. <laughs> Now that I've lost the trunk, I'm still on the local trunk circuit, and I'm going to start flashing it to uh, try to get it to reset. You're never so by flashing, I was able to make the local trunk circuit recycle through and uh, get ready to send those three tones again. Now, what happens if you blow 2600? while those three tones are being sent. Well, first, it causes that little MF sender to stutter. phone you're speaking from, please. I'm sorry, your call did not go through. Will you try your call again later, please? I'm sorry, your call did not go through. Will you try your call again later, please? I'm sorry, your call did not go through. Now, what happened there was the 2600 that I sent reset the TSPS trunk to Greensboro. This caused it to go on hook and then off hook again, as if a new call had come in, confusing the MF sender so that it sent just a one and a start. Lacking a key pulse, the TSPS then sat there waiting a full 15 seconds for a phone number. Then, after it didn't get a phone number, it went ahead and gave me to the operator. And you then heard what happens when you don't give the operator a phone number. You end up going to the TSPS recording. So that's just an example of the, the ways in which we used to like to put the equipment through the paces. It didn't always result in something especially useful or interesting, but uh, we always used to test this equipment to see how it would respond under unusual circumstances. And a lot of interesting stuff was found by using strange methods like this. Well, that's it for this segment. In the next segment, I'll call some of the independent phone companies and also some of the local test lines in this step office, including a test line which your local security agent hopes doesn't exist in your central office. Coming up.